The room really quieted down quickly. Thank you. I'm sorry we're getting started late, um, but here we are, and I'm excited to be moderating this panel. My name is Catherine Augustine. I'm the director of the RAND Corporation office here in Pittsburgh, and the topic of this panel is left-wing extremism. And in many of the other panels you've been attending, probably the vast majority of them, we've been talking about what's considered to be right-wing extremism. Um, and as we should be, as it's categorized now, right-wing extremism is certainly more pre prevalent and more deadly. And you might argue that hate is hate, and maybe there shouldn't be a distinction. However, if you think that the motivation for violence is important and perhaps shapes how we address it and try to prevent it and react to it, then we should understand what's happening on the other side of the political or ideological spectrum. And we've got four experts here with us today to help us do just that. So we're going to start with Jennifer. Each panelist is going to speak for five to ten minutes, and then I'll open it up to questions from the audience. Please come up to that microphone or that microphone if you'd like to answer a question so that people participating online can hear you. Um, and I have questions as well, but I'm going to prioritize your questions when the panelists are done speaking. So Jennifer, please, as you, before you speak, introduce yourselves and hop right in. Absolutely. Thank you, Kate. So I'm Jennifer Carson. I'm from the University of Central Missouri. And today I'm just going to give us some context for why we should study this ideology, why we should study these groups. Um, because we do know that the far right is far more lethal and violent. Um, so why is this important to study at all? Um, so historically, we know from patterns and from the data that are available that these movements are frequent perpetrators, especially of crime. I'm a criminologist myself, and so I'm very interested in kind of the spectrum between criminal behavior and then that which is considered terrorism. Now, again, most often we know that these groups don't fall into that terrorism uh, definition because most often they don't meet the threat of violence or violence uh, criteria. And, and that is because um, things like uh, perhaps vandalizing buildings or in, in certain cases throwing tofu pies in the faces of um, elected officials doesn't necessitate violence or doesn't meet that criteria. Um, and so while they have been nonviolent perpetrators, they have been frequent perpetrators and they've committed a, a bunch of property damage, um, over 200 million um, in the US alone, depending on what estimates you look at. So as a result, especially during the 1990s and early aughts, um, especially the environmental groups, these groups were designated as a top terrorist threat by uh, domestic uh, organizations, especially the uh, FBI. And the problem here really, and I'll talk a little bit about data, and Katrina has some really wonderful data to talk about, um, is that we don't really know the full scope of activity. And that's because, again, crime outweighs terrorism some nine to one with especially this ideology. Um, so it's important to know the full scope of activities. So the history of the far left, we really have three main types that um, represent far left terrorism um, up until, I'd say, 1990. Um, and those are the student radicals, uh, black nationalists and Puerto Rican separatists. Um, we see these kind of three entities um, representing most of the activity. Um, but amongst these groups and amongst, as I'll talk about, the environmental and animal rights groups, Violence is very selective. So there's lots of discussion about the use of violence. It's very targeted when it is used. And there's, awful, there's a lot of um, discussion and debate behind it. Um, we see the Weather Underground, um, one of the most frequent perpetrators, really desisting after uh, discussions of violence. They couldn't come to terms with that. And we also see that with the family, the most notorious group of environmental activists. Um, so again, selective about violence and use of violence. And even a discussion pretty much led to the uh, disbandment of the family. Um, so these groups start in the early 80s, um, pivoted to a focus just on really environmental issues, and I include animal rights within that, um, focused on biocentrism and ideas of equality, deep ecology. So rocks are sentient beings. Everything is has value, which 
I think also makes these groups very interesting. Um, because again, there's a, there's a philosophy based on a morality and a, a respect for human life. And so that also is going to affect whether they decide to use violence. So environmental movements all but desisted um, in 2001. We see very little activity that's specifically motivated by an envi environmental ideology. And there is some evidence of effective countermeasures. And again, I think this is what makes these groups and this ideology interesting. So we see some success with Operation Backfire, and of course that's the uh, JTTF task force that took down the family. And we see some federal legislation mostly involving sentencing enhancements as effective. Um, so there is some, some hope, I guess. <laughs> Um, for uh, countermeasures in terms of this ideology. So some things to be concerned about. Certainly, we have one of the motivators for these groups increasing. Um, and we see, when we look at all the actions, including not just punitive actions by the federal government, but also ways that the government acts in terms of protecting the environment or acting in ways that groups perceive as harmful to the environment that that also has an effect. And especially in terms of um, these groups, when the government acts in ways that they, they find uh, has harm to the environment, we see more criminal activity. We also see from Bill Brandt of testimony that uh, there's an increase in the ideologies amongst what we consider the left wing. So here's, here's some examples from his testimony in 2019 and Katrina will speak to some more recent trends. These groups are also characterized by a couple of different things that might lend us to be concerned. So they have shorter planning cycles, and we know why that's problematic. Certainly, federal law enforcement, is, it's going to take a, uh, more time to essentially find out what's going to happen if they have a shorter planning cycle. They have higher levels of education, and we saw even with the family in Operation Backfire that they're less willing to cooperate. When you see the federal government as your main target and, and something to, as, as something that is motivating your ideology, then certainly you're gonna be less likely to cooperate with them. Um, and also we see this amongst far right, so this is not unique to the, the far left, but a leaderless resistance style. Um, and certainly we know the consequences of that. And then there's a series of high profile events that are concerning. So I'll have Katrina talk more about the more recent data. These are all 2019 um, from the Global Terrorism Database, but certainly there are things that, you know, what, while we can agree with an environmental ideology um, or certain elements of, of this philosophy, um, we're not going to act in ways that are um, criminal or, or fit the realm of terrorism. Okay. So I just wanted to end here with um, a focus on a, a new data set that's being created um, to really get at the scope of what's missing in the behavior. And that is not just acts that are terrorism, which are certainly important, but also criminal behavior, because we know a lot of times crime precedes terrorism. So some of these pre-incident behaviors that are important, we know from Smith and colleagues and their work. Um, also plots, there's been some really interesting work on plots um, on the far right, so it's important to incorporate data on that. And an expansion, not to ju just the environmental crime incidents, which we have a, a good scope of, but also those that are motivated by the far left. Um, so I think without further ado, I'll have Katrina talk about um, her own data, which is uh, kind of picking up where I've left off here, so. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> thanks. Um, hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Katrina Doxey, and I'm the Associate Director and an Associate Fellow with the Transnational Threats Project at CSIS uh, in Washington, D.C. So my team at CSIS has compiled a data set of terrorist attacks and plots in the United States dating back to 1994. 
The most recent data goes through the end of 2021. So I'd like to talk through some of the big trends we're seeing, particularly when looking comparatively between different ideologies, and then specifically what we're seeing from the violent far left in terms of the targets they're choosing and the weapons they're using. So uh, this, this slide here outlines trends that we've seen overall in attacks and plots broken out by perpetrator orientation. Now, I'll, I'll draw your attention to a few things first of all, and these first few things will, I think, resonate with a lot of what you've heard at other panels during this conference. And that is that we've seen a pretty significant increase in domestic terrorist activity in the United States in recent years. Uh, our data has that trend beginning around 2014. And that increase has been largely driven by activity on the violent far right. So perpetrators like white supremacists, anti-government extremists, including militia members, those motivated by extremist conspiracy theories such as QAnon, et cetera. However, I'll draw your attention to uh, the, the green section here in around uh, 2019 through 2021, and that's the violent far left attacks and plots. Even though we've still seen the majority of terrorist activity in the United States coming from the violent far right with two thirds of attacks and plots in 2020 and 49%, roughly half of attacks and plots in 2021 coming from the far right, we've also seen this notable increase in violent far left activity. In 2020, left-wing attacks made up 23% of all domestic terrorist incidents in the United States. And in 2021, that rose to 40%, only 9% behind right-wing attacks and plots. And so while, uh, while the most lethal threat we're seeing, as we've discussed in all parts of this conference over the past few days, is from the far right, we are seeing this very concerning trend from the far left. This is largely driven by anarchists and violent anti-fascist extremists. And I would note that some of, uh, some of those individuals, and particularly the anarchists, also overlap with sort of a new modern day take on some of the environmental terrorism that my colleague has just discussed, uh, particularly when it comes to actions against pipelines, blending concerns about environmentalism with concerns about uh, colonialism or neocolonialism and infringement on native lands. I'd like to also call out a very particular trend that we've seen just explode in the data in 2020 and in 2021. And that is the percentage of all attacks and plots in the United States that have been related to demonstrations. So before I get into the numbers here, I want to define a couple of the terms I'm using here because I know that this um, can get political very quickly. But I think that when we're addressing this issue, especially with the heightened rhetoric we've seen in the country, it's really important to just really get down to as much objective data as we can on where violence is coming from and how we can stop it. So when I say attacks and plots that are related to demonstrations, what I mean is attacks and plots that are committed by demonstrators, attacks and plots that target demonstrators, or incidents which are timed to occur at or alongside demonstrations to maximize their impact. So that third category would be things like the plot that we saw with a group of Boogaloo boys out in Nevada who made plans to attack either a forestry building or a power substation and specifically timed it to occur alongside racial justice protests over the murder of George Floyd so as to create maximum confusion in pursuit of this new civil war that they're hoping to bring about. So what we see in the data when we're looking at these demonstrations is that prior to 2020, a very low percentage of incidents each year were connected to demonstrations. Uh, only about 2% of incidents in 2019 were linked back to demonstrations. We had seen small spikes over the past decade or so um, you'll see here there was an increase around 2011, 2012. That was largely related to the Occupy 
uh, demonstrations, uh, for instance, um, an attack on an Occupy encampment in Maine. Um, you'll also note a bit of an increase around 2016, and that was driven by um, attacks at some of the racial justice protests uh, over police killings of black men in America. But we really see this increase take off in 2020. So those past spikes were still in the single digits in terms of percentages. Uh, in 2020, we saw the percentage of incidents linked to demonstrations. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, in 2020, we saw the percentage of incidents that are linked to demonstrations increase from 2% the previous year to 47%. In 2021, even though the total number of incidents decreased slightly from its historic high in 2020, the percentage linked to demonstrations exceeded half, with 53% linked to demonstrations. What we're ultimately seeing here is something akin to what we talked about in political science as the security dilemma, where efforts by one side to increase its own security against the perceived threat from ideological opponents causes it to arm itself or take defensive measures that in turn threaten their perceived opponents, leading to a potential spiral of escalation. And we're beginning to see that in the streets of some of America's biggest metropolitan areas, when we have individuals who show up to demonstrations or counter demonstrations with the direct intent of carrying out violent acts in pursuit of their ideology, uh, including those that are driven by a fear of the weapons brought to those demonstrations by others. Now, I should be clear that the majority of demonstrations we've seen over the past couple of years have been peaceful and they have been citizens exercising their First Amendment right to demonstration. Actually, the violence at demonstrations that is noted in this data has been proven by studies to have a chilling effect on free speech, actually making Americans, regardless of political ideology, less likely to attend a demonstration if they believe that weapons will be there. I think that makes this a, a very clear bipartisan issue where we should seek to remove the potential for violence, violent extremism and attacks at demonstrations, both for the sake of preventing violence and also for the sake of allowing Americans to exercise their freedom of speech. Moving on to uh, the primary weapons and targets, I think it's notable that even though we've seen historically high levels of both far right and far left violence in recent years, the attacks and plots by those on the violent far right have been significantly more lethal, both in terms of the number of fatalities with nearly all fatalities resulting from far right attacks in 2021, but also in terms of the weapons used. So as you can see here, the most frequent re weapons used on the violent far left are uh, those that fit into this broad category of melee weapons. So this is bludgeoning weapons, handheld items such as bats, stabbing weapons or bladed weapons such as knives or machetes. Whereas the most frequent weapons on the far right are firearms. So you can see even demonstrated here that often the intent behind an attack linked to the weapon choice uh, with a firearm would be lethality, targeting individuals. But these melee weapons used on the far left uh, are often used, as my colleague mentioned, to create property damage, using violence to send a message but without necessarily the intent of lethality. Along with that, I would also just like to highlight that across ideologies and including the violent far left, the most frequent targets of terrorist attacks and plots in the United States in 2021 were government, military, and police, personnel, and locations. Uh, the, the second most frequent uh, for left-wing attackers were businesses. Most of these were carried out in the course of um, attacks from individuals with 
anti-government and anti-law enforcement sentiments, as well as anti-capitalist beliefs targeting the businesses. Now, ultimately, before I wrap up, I just want to also raise this question of how we can get at the real grievances on the far left and how that might differ from individuals on the far right. Certainly individuals such as anarchists who oppose the existence of the US government or any centralized governance system are going to be harder to tackle, much more in line with some of the anti-government views that we see across the ideological spectrum. But I think there's also a lot of lack of trust in our institutions and in the fairness of laws uh, as applied, including against violent individuals. I'd like to read a quote here from Rose City Antifa, which is the nation's oldest anti-fascist coalition located in Portland, Oregon. And this is widely available on their website in their frequently asked questions in terms of why they choose to take action through violence rather than uh, participating with law enforcement or through legal channels. And they say, the state upholds white supremacy at every level of government, and the police frequently work with far-right aggressors to brutalize people opposing state oppression and violence. We cannot count on state actors to push forward the cause of justice, equity, and community safety. It's up to us to keep us safe. I think this draws out one of the tensions that we as practitioners and researchers often have in this field, uh, which is that when we look to ideologies that are focused on community safety, we may agree in principle with the ideas of safety, but we must at its core reject the use of violence and the use of terrorism as a weapon to do so. And when we're dealing with individuals who do view this turn to violence as necessary in those situations, I think there really is a call to strengthening our democratic institutions, strengthening relations with communities, and strengthening their faith in the government and law enforcement's ability to protect communities and to evenly apply the law. And I think that this is going to continue to be a pervasive element as we think about new ways that the government can put resources and efforts behind counterterrorism efforts to ensure peace and stability in our cities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, everyone. Glad to uh, have the opportunity to participate in this panel today. Um, my name is Marilyn Mayo. I'm a senior research fellow at the uh, Anti-Defamation League. And um, I'm going to cover some similar ground um, as my colleagues up here, but um, just using ADL data just for a little bit. So at ADL, um, we empirically assess the threat landscape of domestic extremism. Um, uh, there we go. My, my jacket was in the wrong place. Um, on an annual basis that we, we look at this. And, and this allows us uh, to see how left-wing extremism fits into the threat landscape. And we have found, as others have said, that left-wing extremists often engage in street violence, but engage in deadly violence far less uh, than other types of extremists, particularly right-wing extremists. And one data set that demonstrates this is ADL's annual murder and extremism report, which collects data on all extremist murders regardless of ideology. So over the last 10 years, uh, for example, we have found that left-wing extremists have killed 18 people compared to 333 murders committed by right-wing extremists, um, including white supremacists and anti-government extremists. So, um, and the majority of left-wing murders were by black nationalists targeting police officers. Um, and, and a recent example is in April 2021, when Noah Green used, used his vehicle as a weapon against two Capitol police officers at a barricade outside the US Capitol building, and he killed one officer and injured another. He was killed by an officer when he approach with a knife. And uh, we know that Green was a follower of um, the Nation of Islam and Louis Farrakhan. And um, so, you know, that, that, that was uh, one incident that occurred, but there have been others. And, um, we, you know, so we also, and, and again, um, it, I'll talk a little bit about some other things that were mentioned, but um, we know that the small number of left-wing murder, murders contrast with earlier errors. Uh, when left-wing 
extremists are responsible for more murders, and that would be on, and, and um, this was mentioned earlier, uh, for example, in 1967 to 87, uh, there were more murders committed by new left extremists and black nationalist groups like the Black Panther Party, the Black Liberation Army, and left-wing Puerto Rican nationalist groups. But since the mid-'80s, uh, left-wing extremists have been much more likely to attack property um, uh, rather than people, and, that these, and these incidents were often related to the animal and environmental rights extremists. So, but um, this doesn't mean you know, that current left-wing extremism is not problematic. But what I'm going to focus on right now is the narratives that we're seeing coming from um, basically from the right about left-wing extremism and how it's affecting the current domestic terrorism landscape. So we've seen these narratives develop that are highly exaggerated or actually completely false. And um, the two groups that are disproportionately focused on are Antifa and Black Lives Matter or BLM movement. And, you know, of course, with any movement that, you know, that we monitor, there are a lot of nuances in the group. But I want to talk about a few things that these two groups have in common. Um, and both are decentralized movements and are not controlled by a specific organization or leader. Both are bottom-up organizations that can have elements that are more radical. And both groups have adherents ranging from, you know, from church and religious uh, groups to advocacy groups to individuals with you know varying points of view. Um, sorry, just I'm, <laughs> there we go. So you know regarding anti-fa um, anti-fascism is not inherently problematic, and it's often a reaction against white supremacy, for example. But when people take these ideas and are willing to engage in violence to be anti-fascist, then that is extremist action. And so that's why we say that the Antifa movement has extremist elements to it. But in fact, there has been just one murder linked with Antifa, uh, with an Antifa follower, I should say, in the last 30 years. And that was in 2020 when Michael Rianol, a self-described Antifa activist, shot a member of the far-right Patriot Prayer Group um, uh, uh, at, to, to death during a protest in downtown Portland. Um, and he was charged with murder and became a fugitive and was later killed by police. So um, Back Life is Matter, I want to be very clear, is not an extremist movement, and it's separate from Antifa. Um, but it is, uh, the reason I bring Black Lives Matter up is because it is used in these narratives, and I think it's important to talk about it. But um, Black Lives Matter and Antifa share some grievances, similar grievances, for example, anger at police overreach. And we know that um, BLM gained a lot of momentum after the May 2020 killing of George Floyd with protests across the country. And I think that's some of what you were referring to, um, particularly uh, that summer. And uh, we know, again, that some people associated with those protests saw them as an opportunity to commit crimes such as looting and vandalism and property damage, mostly directed at the police or government buildings. Uh, but these destructive acts really represented a very small number of the broader BLM movement. And we need to be careful really careful with overgeneralizations of Antifa and BLM as groups that are like, you know, one unified force. And I'm talking about each group individually or, or each movement, because it's really not a group. It's really more a movement. Um, but even before the George Floyd protests, um, certain, certain people on the right represented both Antifa and BLM as domestic terrorist threats. And we know that various right-wing sources use scare tactics to say that Antifa was planning violent attacks on white suburbs, or that they were working with Muslim groups uh, to impose Sharia law. And that's just disinformation. But you know, many of the current narratives about left-wing groups um, stem from equating the protest movement around the murder of George Floyd and others, uh, other victims of police killings with the events that took place on January 6th, um, you know, when a mob attacked the US Capitol, intent on interfering with the certification of the 2020 election. So we know that you know, that group, and you've heard this many times, so many people have talked about January 6th because it's such an important event and include Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, a small number of white supremacist militia members, sovereign citizens, QAnon and other conspiracy adherents, as well as people radicalized by election-related conspiracy theories. So um, I just want to talk about the three major narratives that have emerged from this attack on the Capitol on January 6th from the right about the left. 
Um, the first one is that protesters who came to the Capitol on January 6th believed that the left, in the form of Democrats, um, were stealing the, the 2020 presidential election and that the protesters were justified in their actions at the Capitol. The second narrative emerged um, after the attack on the Capitol, that the protesters at the Capitol and their supporters, uh, they equivocated about their violent actions, saying that they were no worse than the actions of Antifa or BLM at their protests. Uh, the third narrative that emerged was that January 6th six protesters and their supporters were, um, were they, that they refused to take responsibility for their role at the Capitol and blamed uh, Antifa uh, or other people on the left uh, for carrying out the attack. So um, just, just to demonstrate how some of these narratives uh, against the left can get out of hand in the summer of 2020, disinformation was put, put forth saying that anti-fascists or BLM started wildfires in Oregon. And, um, and that sparked a lot of rumors that leftists were starting wildfires around the country. Um, and that led to an attack on a, a family camping in Washington State because people thought their van was like an Antifa van, uh, Antifa transport vehicle. But we know and, and that Antifa is being politicized, um, which, which doesn't, you know, again, there are, um, I want to, you know, say that there are some uh, elements of Antifa that have taken violent action, so I don't want to disregard that. But we know that um, Antifa is being politicized in, in a lot of ways that feeds into more anti-left sentiment from the right. And these types of narratives can create a violent response from right-wing extremist groups. And we have to understand that this, this framing of Antifa, these narratives about Antifa are part of the current extremist landscape that we're seeing on the right, where you have groups like the Proud Boys and um, Patriot Prayer actually organizing specifically just against the left, and you know, which leads to these, some of these violent confrontations. Um, so, you know, we're always asked, is there an equivalence between left and right-wing violence? And we would say that even though some Antifa adherents have demonstrated a willingness to use violence to counter far-right actors, you, it's important to understand that one cannot claim equivalence between the two, because the truth is that we just do not see Antifa actors engaging in the same level of organizing and coordination to use violence to achieve their political objectives. Um, and I'll just go on to see just a couple more things that the narratives, as these narratives that villainize the left continue, we're seeing escalating language and action. For example, numerous attacks against the LGBTQ community um, by groups, far right groups like the Proud Boys and other groups disrupting, um, you know, drag queen story hours at libraries, showing up at school board meetings, protesting at, at hospitals um, and threatening hospitals uh, who deal with transgender youth. Um, and all based on this idea that the left, in, in the form of the LGBTQ community, other communities, is destroying America by destroying gender roles and traditional roles. And, you know, we're, um, there's been a lot of talk about the election, and I'll finish by saying we are very concerned about the narratives, you know, around the 2022 midterms um, with talk about, you know, the country from the right, about the country being, you know, at war against the left, and there's a civil war, something must be done. And the question becomes, what are we going to see on that day if there are actions by um, you know, bad actors on the right, how will the left respond to those actions? And what, what kind of violence will we see possibly from both ends in this incredibly polarized country right now? And I'm going to stop there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Right. So um, I want to start by saying that I really appreciate the diversity of this uh, panel. Um, and to hear about the, you know, the concern and statistics and, you know, and the sentiment. Um, so I'm going to bring a different perspective to the, to the conversation. And um, so I'm not a, policy, uh, a, a public policy expert or uh, an academic researcher. I'm kind of the person that answered the helpline when someone calls the 184449 piece. Uh, I answer those family members that are worried about a loved one that is falling into extremism. Just a little bit of background about Parents for Peace. So it actually was founded by an African-American uh, father uh, whose son uh, converted to Islam, become an, an Islamist, uh, went to Yemen, got radicalized a little bit more, came back, shot two people. Actually, the, his first stop was to blow up a synagogue. He fell and he ended up uh, shooting two people in front of a recruitment center, and he killed one person, and now he's serving several life uh, sentences. 
So Parents for Peace was focusing first uh, about Islamist cases and also white supremacists because that was the main threat and also people that were about to commit, um, you know, an act of terror. And so, um, so that's what we were doing. And the helpline was really to kind of serve and equip family members when they had no idea what to do to prevent an act of terrorism. So, um, like many people, I just, when I heard the first time about Antifa or anti anti fascist, I felt like, wow. That's pretty cool. Uh, I'm an anti-fascist. Who is not, really? <laughs> so I never really took uh, the uh, extreme left seriously until the beginning of COVID. And I think that COVID have really helped me take a look at a whole dimension of extremism and uh, also kind of like really discovering, um, you know, a new part of the American extremist group. And, and believe me, there's more than that, you know. And so, um, you know, so we don't collect data yet, but I really hope, but one thing that is good about the helpline of Parents for Peace, uh, because families call us when they are desperate, is that we had like a few miles ahead. Like for instance, in the beginning of COVID, we have seen a spike, you know, of a new way of extremism where concerned me and it appeared in the media and in your data research later on. So what I'm about, uh, so what I'm going to do today, you know, just to, for the sake of really understanding what I'm talking about is that I'm not going to talk about many cases and I'm going to be trying to be careful about confidentiality, but I'm going to just use one particular case that will kind of cover many of the, what, the topic we're talking about. So at the beginning of COVID, I had a phone call from a mother, you know, um, from the West Coast, mid, you know, major city, West Coast, and I'm sure that you probably are guessing which one, um, because it's such a hub, you know, of uh, uh, ext uh, left-wing extremists, and was telling me that she was devastated because her son was in Syria fighting, you know, in the Syrian uh, country. And then I just assumed that, oh, it's an ISIS case. Uh, and as she was talking to me, I was a little confused. And then she said, no, my son actually was part of Antifa. And, you know, and he kept getting arrested because of his violence. He kept, you know, fighting and, and, um, and she was really concerned about his safety and he was in and out in prison. Um, you know, so when you hear the devastation from a parent's point of view, it's kind of a little bit different, you know, because uh, when you're in an office, and I really appreciate what you guys are doing, but, but you know, it's easy to remove ourselves than when we start talking to family members and what it does to families and also to the, the kids. And so this kid, you know, it turned out as I and collected the history, startled me because you, it could have been a mother that was calling about a loved one that was re recruited by ISIS or by white supremacy or by QAnon. We were talking about the, exactly the same kid. So while the ideology was different, the process of the grooming and the recruitment and why, and, and you know, they, they got into this extremism is exactly the same thing. Take a young man, remove the brand, you have the same person. So I just want to to humanize the situation, to really understand more about the, you know, the problem. And so um, she explained to me that the place where she lives, you know, Antifa is very active and it's a huge part of the community. And, and that mom actually, the family is more like a left, you know, leaning family that really are doing the right thing, all the social justice, you know, check the right boxes. But what she realized is that her son take the social justice action about the oppressed to something that was extremely worrisome and that was ruining his life. And it turned out that I could compare the story of this young man, the same as other uh, ideology, because he was sexually molested when he was young. The mother didn't know that. She's a doctor, you know, by the way. And she said, I couldn't reach out for help because I was afraid to be intimidated by Antifa groups because it's not a thing. If I were a mother of a white supremacist, I would get help. But I'm actually scared for my son and I'm scared for my family to be attacked. So that's opened like a whole world to me about a problem that I didn't know about. And so she said that actually a teacher kind of really got him into Antifa. And suddenly, um, you know, he was just dealing with drugs and fight and, you know, it was just a big mess. Uh, 
And, um, and then it turned out that he ended up in Syria because he was recruited to fight with, with the YPG. So what she didn't really understand is that why all those you know, kids from Antifa end up in Syria and fighting with the YPG? How is it even possible? How is it connected? Well, it turned out that there's many ideologies that are very similar, you know, because they fight also the fascism, you know. So, um, so what the, the story here is that this young man turned from 19 to age 20 to 20 to 21, his birthday in, a, in Syria in a war zone. So this kid from, you know, fighting for Antifa, now he's a soldier. He uh, knows how to use the Kalashnikov. He has already killed many people. And one of his goal is to return to the United States to create his own militia. Those are soldiers. So it's not in your statistics yet. And I really hope that, please, heads up, take a look of all those young men that are about to return and that they are soldiers. So... Um, it's true that in our helpline, most of our cases are still white supremacists and, and uh, Islamist cases. But I think that it's really important to pay attention and to look at the devastation of what extremists does to family and to young people. By the way, this young man now wants to return after two year, more than two years fighting and coming back home. But actually, his passport is being held because he's really valuable to the YPG. Many of those kids... American kids, European kids are fighting in Syria because, you know, because of their ideology. So what I want to say, I agree that the problem of extremism is highly politicized, highly. But I would argue, actually, that it's highly politicized by the two sides of the spectrum of the politics. And the polarization is really preventing us to look at a deeper level, not a shallow level, but a deeper level about what is happening to our boys. What's happening to this young American that are so hurting that they are, access, they are going to an extremist ideology to deal with underlying issues that are not resolved. And another kind of thing that we are not talking about is we have seen the, 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 the people that we are helping, we have seen them moving from one ideology to another. Now, when we talk about, oh, this one is worse, we, when we are going into the competition or the Olympics of which one is bad and worse and stuff like that, what we are not asking the question is that same young man that is a white supremacist is actually moving and shifting into uh, uh, becoming an Islamist, and then to Antifa. Some people that are in far extremist left, they are moving into white supremacists, and that's something we don't talk about, and we see that. This is what we are dealing with. So um, it's astonishing, uh, you know, kind of phenomena, but it's important, and we actually have launched a peer support group for family members of all kind of uh, extremism, so they can talk to each other. The uh, problem of supremacy is so similar, you know, and that's one of the reasons why when we work with former supremacists, we work cross ideology because there is a deeper problem that we need to kind of really think about why our kids are violent and why they need to use extremist groups. You know, so this is the really the part that I want to bring, you know, into into the conversation. Great. Thank you. And thank you all. I really appreciate your diverse perspectives and your knowledge and your wisdom. And it says we have 10 minutes left. My clock says we have a couple of minutes left. Um, please make your way. Wait, someone just raised his hand in the background. Please make your way to these uh, microphones to ask questions. Looks like we have someone now. Would you like to come up? Thank you for, for a wonderful presentation. This is like one of the most common questions I'm asked about left wing. So, okay. so, th so thank you. Um, and, and we found... Um, the, f the first uh, hard left killings, we don't put the racial stuff in the left. Um, in years was in 2020, but we counted three. There were a couple of Chaz killings. So here's what I'd like to ask, um, because this is like kind of like playing baseball with other baseball players, researchers and stuff. Um, I'd like you to comment <clears throat> on the heterogeneity. Um, and also, your local mileage may vary. So for instance, in California, we found a doubling in violent demonstrations in our state 2017 over 2016, first three quarters compared. And, and the reasons change. Sometimes it, it revolves around immigration or police use of force, that, that kind of thing. The other thing in 2020, we found a, a much wider geographic spread. And having gone to a lot of these rallies over three decades, um, what I think was so interesting, I'd like, like to hear the comment on it, 
is that I think there's a greater range of tools used by the left. Yeah, they have a big bark, and, and sometimes they do do a horrible, violent things, which I obviously condemn, but they do a lot of stuff like doxing and another stuff with their violence that I think is a little different, but it does escalate and sometimes kind of crosses over, right, is that um, a lot of the violence I saw from the hard left was uh, to humiliate and then push them out. Um, but I also saw something that disturbed me uh, that was an arms race as well. So what, it, what I'd like to ask you is, how do you a couple of things? The local stuff, like in other words, Portland is different than a lot of other places. So how do you uh, account for, there's no like national weather, uh, how do you account for these different geographic differences and also the different tools? Because the hard right and the white supremacists really are looking to like, you know, glorify mass killings where I think the hard left is more like standing up and of course they use different tools so anyway thank you so much uh, and I'm a welcome comment from anyone on this great panel Brian Levin from Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism thank you Brian I'm gonna ask Jennifer if she wants to answer first only because I know you have a flight to catch so if if she leaves the stage before the rest of us, that's why. You know, I think actually Katrina might be more poised okay. since she has more recent data. Um, and I would say certainly historically we see a mix of ideologies. Um, but I think that is, that is becoming more of a recent phenomenon, um, especially in the, the 80s and 90s. The fixation on environmental and animal rights was very much the motivation, and it, it was a singular focus. Um, but I, I'll, I'll let Katrina comment on the last couple of years, which where we see that expansion to 10 ideologies and yeah. focus. And I, I would also second that um, in terms of just blending ideologies. As I had mentioned, uh, we're certainly seeing some of the modern environmental uh, extremism blending with some of the anarchism as well. Um, there have been several of the attacks actually on pipeline construction sites that have been uh, directly claimed by anarchist organizations um, and uh, attributed to their belief systems. But I, I think more broadly, I, I'm not in a great position to answer your question on um, sort of actions short of violence, doxing, et cetera. Um, our work has really focused on terrorism itself defined um, in terms of violence or the threat of violence because that's you know, trying to cut out some of that gray area to be able to directly say, this is violent extremism, these are acts of terrorism, um, and can fall under uh, domestic terrorism policies and criminal uh, statutes accordingly. So I don't know if anyone else on the panel is better equipped to talk about those nonviolent aspects. Well, I, I mean, I think we, we certainly have seen, um, you know, I, I remember, you know, I've been at the ADL for 25 years. Um, all the activity that went on in the early 2000s, like in Seattle and the destruction of prop property and, and attacking Starbucks and things like that, what we've seen a lot more of is, is what, what Brian mentioned about the doxing, is that a lot of Antifa groups, the, their goal is to actually get um, people, um, you know, like white supremacists and others, fired and, um, you know, uh, exposed. And so that is a, a tactic that's being used quite a lot and that I think is actually, in some ways, they find more effective, right? Because it's actually changing, like, you know, affecting those people's lives in a very direct way. So that is something that, that we've seen. And Brian, I just want to clarify one thing. I talked about Black Lives Matter uh, in terms of how the right perceives it as being part of the left. I just want to clarify that. So um, I'm going to stop there. But. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, and then I think someone else needs the room. So, How's it going? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Mike Hayden from SPLC. Uh, I just want to clarify a few things that were said here. Um, there are not a lot of leftists going to Syria. Uh, if you had a beach, right? And e let, let's say even that was a problem. But um, if you had like three, it'd be like, like three or four grains of purple sand on a beach, you wouldn't be able to see it. So... This is like just to put it in people's you know, in context for people. There are not a lot of leftists going off to Syria to fight wars. So, just want to make sure everybody understands that. The other thing was about Michael Rainhall was mentioned, um, who uh, shot that Patriot Prayer uh, member um, at you know during 
was essentially a you know a fascist invasion of Portland, right? Uh, that is the context of where that happened, and there are a lot of questions about how Reinhold was killed. Yes. Um, a lot of people think it was an extrajudicial murder at the hands of U.S. Marshals during the Trump administration. Um, so that is, that's a big issue, that's a big question. And one of the reasons uh, a lot of people are not asking about it is because of this conflation with anti-fascism and terrorism, which is what I saw during your slide here. So I wanna know, like, how do you define terrorism? Because if you're talking about something of the equivalent of El Paso, where a guy goes, travels nine hours, and guns down 24 people, and you're comparing that to someone, you know, chucking an incendiary device at a uh, that you know breaks some glass or something at a Bank of America, and you are putting a false equivalence on that chart. Those are the very types of things that get people to call me a terrorist, for example, and the murder threats that I get and see in my family, and the very justification that was used to murder Heather Hare in Charlottesville, who was also considered a terrorist by the guy who who killed her. So I want to know how you go about justifying what terrorism is or isn't. Uh, because to me, I know of no equivalent to what I saw in El Paso, uh, a tree of life um, in Poway. I know no equivalent of what I saw in Christchurch. I know equi no equivalent of what I saw on January 6th. So I'd be very curious what uh, counts as a left-wing terrorist to you. Thank you so much for your comments. And I know Katrina will answer with her definition, and then we will, we will end. Yeah, thank you for the question and the comments. Um, so our definition that we use for terrorism is the use or threat of violence by, am I cutting out again? Sorry. Um, the use or threat of violence by a non-state actor uh, in line with a political motive and with the goal of creating a broader psychological impact. And so, in that definition, we do not distinguish between different levels of violence, uh, but there needs to be that aspect of violence by a non-state actor, a political objective, and this desire to create the broad psychological impact. I would note that our other variables we track, including um, things like number of fatalities, types of weapon used, uh, et cetera, not all of which uh, I was able to cover during this brief presentation, do get into a lot more of the nuance in terms of looking at mass killings versus incidents with no fatalities. Uh, so for example, in 2021, all but two of the fatalities that resulted from terrorist attacks in the United States were committed by white supremacists, anti-government individuals, and violent misogynists. Uh, we had one uh, each by a jihadist and by a far left individual. Um, there certainly is a difference in terms of lethality, and when you start breaking down data on, for example, mass shootings, you certainly have differences across ideologies. But based on our definition of terrorism, that does not innately uh, distinguish between those other characteristics. You have to dig deeper into the data for that. I think that it's important when we're looking at terrorism, certainly to acknowledge differences in lethality of threat, in the type of action that we're seeing by individuals of different ideologies and within different movements. But it's also important to get this broad sense of the landscape of how different ideologies, different motives play into the threat environment of political violence in the United States, how that grows over time, and how they may interact with one another. Thank you. If, Please join. If, if you don't mind, I'm not going to um, talk about the definition. But okay, I, sorry, sorry, okay, sorry. Okay. I'm, getting, I'm getting cut off. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> Please join sorry. me in thanking this panel. Okay. Thank you all. Sorry, Mario. That's okay. It's okay. <laughs>